Rome was greater than Babylon. It is comparing Rome to Babylon. So if you're using a comparative term about God and you claim that you're a monotheistic religion, then who is your God greater than? Hmm? Is Allah greater than a garden slug? Is Allah greater than than uh, Baal, the um, Babylonian and Persian god? Is Allah greater than uh, Jesus, the Christian god? Who is Allah greater than? That's a fairly significant uh, differentiation. And oh, by the way, Allahu does not mean God. Il and Illa are the Arabic words for God, both taken from the Hebrew, where El and Elohim and Eloah are the Hebrew words for God. The Quran is very clear in stating, and it says many, many times, that the Islamic Ilan's name is Allah. So Allah cannot be God unless the Quran is being deliberately deceitful relative to the title and name. Allah is a name. Il and Illah are words. So the title is Allah is greatest. Allah is greater. Allah is bigger. Allah is older. Bigger, older, and greater than whom? Uh, when you understand that, you understand exactly who Allah is and what Islam is all about. And all it takes is a modicum of research to recognize that Allah U Akbar is being shouted by these Islamic jihadists in Syria as they perpetrate such carnage because it was first uttered by Muhammad and the first Muslims as they attacked a Jewish farming community called Kabar. And in Kabar, as the Muslims surrounded the town that was filled with farmers, whose only weapons were their garden shovels, Muhammad told his Mujahideen, his Islamic terrorist, to shout Allahu Akbar at the Jews. The Jews, who were called Yaud and Yaudim in the Quran and by the Muslims, which means related to Yahweh, were being told that their God, the Muslim God Allah, was greater, was bigger, was older than the God of the Yahuda. Yahweh. That's what it's all about. Allah wants to be greater than Yahweh. Allah wants to be worshipped as if he were God. That's Satan's desire. And so once you know what that Akbar is a comparative term, and then you find the context in what it was first used, it's easy to ascertain who Allah is, Satan, what he is trying to achieve through Islam, which is to be worshipped as if he were God. And you understand that when a Muslim shouts Allah U Akbar, as they did when they flew planes into our buildings in 9-11, sorry, conspiracy theorists, it wasn't a government plot, that Allah U Akbar is a confession. You don't need a tribunal, you don't need a an investigation into who perpetrated the terrorist attacks of 9-11, those suicide bombings. You don't know, need to do an investigation as to why they did it. They confess to it. Allahu Akbar. It is amongst the most important statements to understand. It's called the Islamic Prayer of Fear. It is uttered by every Islamic terrorist before they detonate themselves or blow someone else into oblivion. 
when you understand it, when you are knowledgeable, when you shed your ignorance and actually begin to logically make the connections and come to understand what it means, then the world changes for you. You gain perspective. You gain the power that comes along with understanding. And that's why we talk about the news in this segment of the program. There was a single knife-wielding assailant who wounded six people today in an attack in a railway station in China's southern cities. Police say that the individual was a Islamic jihadist. It doesn't matter where in the world these individuals are. Their race is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if they're Chinese or if they are Indonesian or if uh, they are Arabic, Arabs. Makes no difference. The religion is the same. The poison is the same. The reason for them lashing out and mutilating innocent people is always the same. And it will continue to happen. Whether it's Muslims mutilating their own little girls, or it's Muslims mutilating all who aren't Muslims, it will continue until more people come to understand what Allahu Akbar means, why it was said, and who it was spoken of. Dateline Los Angeles. There was a a protest. Somebody actually, but for incomplete reasons, actually did the right thing. In uh, West Los Angeles, suburbs of Beverly Hills might actually be in uh, Beverly Hills, a number of charities um, decided that they were not going to hold their fundraisers at the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel. I've been to the Beverly Hills Hotel. Kind of a uh, an old, tired building now. It was old and tired back in the times that I attended functions there. It's really old and tired now. And yet, uh, it's got a fine location. Why do you suppose that the charities that is scheduled to hold fundraisers at the Beverly Hills Hotel would cancel them? And why is that news? Well, perhaps it's because the Beverly Hills Hotel is owned by the Sultan of Brunei, who has decided to impose Sharia law. We'll be back in a moment. Well, he was out getting uh, lunch during our last segment. Can you imagine uh, that? Well, the story in the, with the... Um, boycott of the Beverly Hills Hotel for fundraisers. Now imagine you're going to choose a place for a fundraiser and you choose a place as expensive as the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, it's interesting in, in and above it by itself. Now, you think the protesters are saying, well, Sharia law uh, promotes terrorism, uh, so we out and go. Sharia law is the fundamental basis of Islam, so we ought to uh, to not uh, have our charity here because it's owned by an advocate of Islam and the Sultan of Brunei. Nope. It's because uh, the Sharia law uh, leads to the mutilation of tens of millions of little girls, to the kidnap of little girls to the rape of women around the world. And that we ought not attend because Sharia law is promoting rape and, and genital mutilation of little girls. Nope, that wasn't the reason either. How about that there's a direct correlation between Sharia law and 99% uh, of terrorist acts worldwide? Nope. Maybe it's the fact that Sharia law uh, impoverishes the people. Nope. Why were they in West Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, 
unwilling to go to and hold their charity at the Beverly Hills Hotel because of the Sultan of Brunei imposing uh, Sharia law in his little fiefdom. Well, because it's opposed to homosexual sex. That was the reason. Because it's opposed to homosexual sex. That's the only reason. Tells you a lot, doesn't it? Well, the Supreme Court uh, produced a ruling that five to four decisions, so it was split decisions, uh, that uh, I was just dumbfounded. They voted five to four in favor of allowing uh, Christian prayer at public meetings. Yep, this, the, the essence of the Supreme Court, Justice Anthony Kennedy's advice for atheists and others who objects to sectarian, uh, well, we just call it spade spade, Christian prayers, before government meetings is to walk out. Eh, just don't listen. You have to endure it. The five to four decision written by uh, Supreme Court Justice Kennedy is uh, now, um, and by the way, it was the Supreme Court case uh, that allowed uh, Greece, uh, New York, is the town, to continue to host prayers before, official prayers, by the way, before its monthly town board meetings. So, civic organization, a uh, town board, can continue to have overtly Christian prayers to their Lord Jesus Christ before a board meeting, even though an atheist or Jewish citizen is attending that meeting and doesn't want to have to be subjected to the, uh, the overtly Christian testimony of the participants. Don't just walk out. Cover your ears. Many members of the country's majority faith, that is, Christians, hailed the ruling. Oh, wonderful. Yes, man, yeah, that's great. By the way, I don't think Christianity is the nation's um, majority faith anymore. I think it's political correctness, social secular humanism. Many members of minority faiths, as well as atheists, atheists, by the way, is a minority faith. Atheism is faith. You can be an agnostic and have no faith, but you can't be an atheist without faith. Responded with palatable anger, saying the Supreme Court has set them apart as second-class citizens. Groups from the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism to Hindu American Foundation decried Monday's decision. As, by the way, they should. The court's decision to bless majority rules prayer is out of step with the changing face of America, which is more secular and less dogmatic, said Rob Boston, a spokesperson for Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which litigated the case. Well, you lost, pal, so you don't feel good about it. At least one justice, Elena Kagan, seemed to agree. And while Kennedy's decision reads like a lesson in American history, Kagan's dissent offers a picture of the country's increasingly pluralistic present. American politicians, Kennedy claimed, have prayed before public gatherings since the founding fathers crowded into stuffy Philadelphia rooms to crank out the Constitution, Kennedy writes. It's not where they cranked out the Constitution, and they weren't Christians. Welcome back to Shattering This. The uh, article presents uh, the uh, this uh, rebuttal, I guess, uh, to Kennedy, who says that uh, that American politicians prayed before public gatherings since the founding fathers crowded into that stuffy Philadelphia room to crank out the Constitution. That's not where they cranked it out, by the way. It's a group of Virginians that got together to write the U.S. Constitution with Madison and Moreau uh, leading the charge. This article says, The inaugural and emphatically Christian prayer at the First Continental Congress was delivered by an Anglican 
minister who overcame objections from the assembled Quakers, Anabaptists, and Presbyterians. And that's really funny in a way. Here you've got a country that is saying that we don't want to be part of uh, the British Empire anymore. We don't want to show our allegiance to the king of England. And yet the king of England is the head of the Anglican Church. All the Anglican Church is is, uh, is a British version of Catholicism. The Catholics didn't much like the fact that the Pope wouldn't, uh, wouldn't appease them. Uh, and uh, it happened to be over uh, uh, adultery. And so they said, okay, well, the heck with you. We'll form our own Catholic Church, exactly the same religion, but we're going to say that our king is the Pope as opposed to you, Pope. And so here you've got the, the very religion that imposes the royalty upon the British uh, uh, citizens and the British royalty system upon the colonies, the Anglican Church. And you've got an Anglican minister that is leading the official prayer at the First Constitutional Congress. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's just unbelievably stupid. And, of course, the Quakers and the Anabaptists and the Presbyterians all objected. The Freemasons, by the way, um, which were really in charge of the Constitution, didn't seem to care because Freemasonry is sort of an amalgamation of, uh, of religions. Kennedy said the prayer united uh, the mostly Christian founding fathers and the rest is history. Well, the fact is that America's founding fathers weren't mostly Christian. Uh, they were a blend of a lot of things, but the most important, the leading founding fathers, the ones that had the greatest role in shaping America as we know it today, were Freemasons. And once you uh, dissect Freemasonry, you learn very quickly that it ain't Christian. That ultimately the the rising sun and light that shines upon the pyramid of Freemasonry is Halal ben Shakar, also known as the adversary. The Hebrew word for it. the adversary is Ha Satan. Well, evidently the Supreme Court doesn't do its homework and really doesn't know its history. There is a phenomenon shaping the world of Catholicism. It's called the Francis Effect. Now, this guy is several cards shy of a full deck. His oars don't all reach the water. He has some, said some of the dumbest, ignorant, just overtly stupid things that have ever come out of the mouth of a Pope. And that's, that's saying something, because they've said some pretty stupid stuff. And yet, because he's just a bumbling fool who seems not to be caught up in the pomp and ceremony of being a Pope, he has an effect. Yes. Rather than people running away from Roman Catholicism, who has its being exposed for its money laundering in its Vatican Bank, as it's being exposed for, for abusing hundreds of thousands of little boys through acts of condoned priestly pedophilia that were covered up by the Pope and the Vatican, they're flocking back to the Roman Catholic Church because of the Francis effect. Here's uh, the voice of the faithful, a Boston-based reform group, is saying, he's sent us an invitation, and now many of us are deciding whether to come to the party. Yeah, he sent an invitation to all to be damned. He sent an invitation to be corrupted. He sent an invitation for you to squander your soul. There are seven invitations that linger untold. Um, Yahweh invited all of us to attend seven parties. Yes, Yahweh's seven parties are Pesach, Matzah, Bakurim. Shavua, Teruah, Kippurim, and Sukkah. Not one Christian and a million knows about God's invitations to party. 
The Hebrew word chog is associated with them. They are festival feasts. They are parties. Grand celebrations of our relationship with God. And yet they're ignored. And because a buffoon is popular, because he's just one of the guys, that Catholics think, oh, we've been invited to a party. He's throwing a party for us. Let's attend. Oh, my, how easy people are fooled. It becomes a cult of personality. This uh, article is from CNN. It begins one year ago this month. Boko Haram's leader, Abu Baker Shaku. Abu Baker is, uh, is interesting. Uh, Abu is an endearing term in, uh, in Islam. It was a prize to, uh, applied to a fellow named Baker. Most uh, people have, have no idea who Abu Baker is, but Abu Baker is uh, t- to a large degree why Islam exists. When Muhammad was just muttering foolishness, when all he was doing was uh, 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 spewing out uh, plagiarized material from uh, uh, Hanifs, which were uh, polytheists in Yemen, and uh, stealing their poetry uh, while (laughs) trying to satiate his desire for sex, power, and money. Abu Bakr was the only man amongst the Quraysh tribe there in Mecca uh, that decided that, you know, maybe I could make a buck if I uh, side with this uh, loon. And he did. And to endear himself to Muhammad, he not only pledged money that enabled Muhammad to have his own private armies, similar to what George Prescott Bush and uh, what um, uh, Walker uh, did uh, relative to George Herbert Walker did relative to uh, Adolf Hitler with the brown shirts. Abu Bakr did more than finance um, Muhammad's initial goons. He gave his six-year-old daughter to Muhammad as a sex toy. That's who Abu Bakr is. So when you wonder why the words that come out of this cleric's mouth on behalf of Boko Haram seem twisted, perverted sexually, Understand, he's named after Islam's co-founder, Abu Bakr, who sacrificed his own six-year-old daughter to endear himself with Muhammad, allowing his six-year-old daughter to be the 53-year-old Muhammad's sex toy. And then you come to understand the nature of this religion. Well, he released a video announcing a new which this CNN says, reprehensible front in his bloody attempt at forced Islamization. His fighters will begin abducting girls and selling them. Now, is that Abu Bakr Shuku's own interpretation of Islam? Is this this man's idea that he pulled out of thin air to achieve his goals, or is that part and parcel of Islam? Come to find out, Muhammad financed Islam by kidnapping little boys and little girls and then selling them. He then, uh, when he couldn't kidnap and find enough individual buyers for kidnap victims, he began to enslave little boys and girls and sold them. Muhammad actually created a religion based on the idea that men could have sex with their captive slaves. That it was okay. In fact, it was good for them to be terrorists and then to satiate their carnal desires with the children that they captured as they would perpetrate these grotesque acts of terrorism. The Quran itself affirms this. The Hadith says it in no uncertain terms. He's using... Sharia law, to impose Sharia law. You see, in Sharia law, kidnapping is good. Getting ransom from a kidnapped victim in Sharia law is good. Raping little girls in Sharia law is good. So he's using Sharia law to impose Sharia law. Now, if you don't think rape 
and pedophilia and kidnap and enslaving little children is good, then you ought to be opposed to Sharia law and opposed to Islam. Now, Abu Bakr said that the kidnappings were in retaliation for Nigerian security forces nabbing the wives and children of group members. Do I believe that the Nigerian security forces are are um, reprehensible? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I've read many accounts where they've uh, they've been vicious. But are they deliberately kidnapping the wives and children of Boko Haram members? No, nah, not a chance. But when does telling the truth ever? become part of the agenda of a religious group. Never been important to a religious group. So they justify their abuse by saying, well, we were abused first. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you're a moral individual, let's say that, let's say it really happened. Let's say that the, <laughs> that the government, through its police, uh, directed its police to kidnap the um, boys and girls of fundamentalist Muslims. And innocent fundamentalist Muslims, just Muslims who were just trying to be good Muslims, and that the government somehow conspired with the police to kidnap their children. How would kid and, and you view that as bad. How would kidnapping the children of innocent people that had nothing to do with the government be good? How to one relates to the other. How do you go from, it was wrong for them to kidnap my children, but it's right for me to kidnap someone else's children who had nothing to do with it? Dr. Shiko has uh, said that the kidnappings of Christian girls is going to be in retaliation for the Nigerian security forces nabbing the wives and children of their group members. Now, let's just suppose that they were. I don't think they are, but let's suppose that they were. How would taking the children of a group unrelated to the government be justified? If you, if you say kidnapping isn't good, they shouldn't be doing that, then why are you doing it? And why are you doing it not to the security forces, but instead to innocent bystanders? And if uh, kidnapping is good, then why are you upset that they took your children? I mean, there's no way to make any sense of this. This is the problem of, of religion. It causes people to be irrational. And it's ubiquitous. It's not just true of Islam. It's true of most every religion. And also, the Supreme Court, Kennedy of the Supreme Court, uh, probably a pretty smart guy. He had to succeed in school to get into law school, had to succeed in law school to become a judge, had to succeed as a judge to become a federal judge, and he had to succeed as a federal judge to earn the appointment. It's his romp through American history was stupid, but he's religious. Anyway, what, uh, this is um, uh, said that something has changed uh, uh, now, according to CNN. When this first happened, what I was hearing from my friends, and this is a quote now from a fellow named uh, Emika Daniel, whose uh, father was kidnapped in Nigeria in an unrelated incident. He says, when this first happened, uh, what I was hearing from my friends and from other people was like, why do I care? Nigeria is done. Nigeria is going to disintegrate. What he's saying is that ultimately when Muslims start to terrorize a country, that ultimately the country is destroyed. And that's largely true. Islam is able to conquer something and then to transform it into something good, but they're very good at killing and destroying. 
He said, I refuse to believe that. We can't let this be the new normal. But that's what the world is doing. The new normal is to give up rights and to live in a world full of terrorists. In the new normal, the people who are not terrorists are subjected to long lines and invasive searches and having their freedoms and their money confiscated. Well, the uh, terrorists are never held accountable because no one wants to blame Islam. That's the new normal. So here we are. Uh, in this particular article, wants to provide six reasons why the Boko Haram abductions, the repugnant message its leader has released this week, and Nigeria's inadequate response should matter to the rest of the world. Should matter, but doesn't matter. You know, the, the charities that were scheduled to host their events in the Beverly Hills Hotel didn't say, we're not coming here because... It is Sharia law that is being imposed by the owner of this hotel, the Sultan of Brunei, that is responsible for the kidnap, abduction, and rape of little girls. No, it didn't matter to them. So anyway, this is the six reasons that, uh, now we're not going to go through all six of them, that uh, these abductions by Boko Haram, not Islam, should be of concern. First was, just imagine if 276 girls had been kidnapped in the United States. The response would be outrage and a forceful demand for a response, you know. It's, look at the Boston bombings. It's in the marathon. You know, it's about that number of people were either killed or, not by three people were killed, but um, about that number were mutilated. And yet, no one seemed to care that Islam was responsible. Oh, all sorts of manner of blame, but no one wanted to point the finger at Islam. So I'm not even sure what a matter where it took place. This one says, as borders become more irrelevant for terrorists, the whole world needs to take notice of the likes of Boko Haram. Well, why don't we begin by using our words correctly? As borders become irrelevant for Islamic terrorists, the world needs to take notice of the likes of Islam. Wouldn't that make sense? We need to take ownership as if this happened in Chicago, or if this happened in Washington, D.C., said Nicole Lee, outgoing president of the Trans-Africa Forum. We need to be talking about this. We need to make sure that our government is helping in any way that we can. But CARE, the organization for American Islamic cooperation won't allow it, won't even allow it to be discussed. 